Hey everybody, uh, I'm Ian, I'm one of the uh, CodeJam engineers. So I write problems and uh, prepare them and try to make sure the platform runs as smoothly as possible. Hi everyone, I'm Lalit. I work on Clickstart. In my 20% time, I design problems and uh, write test cases for books. All right, so I just wanted to talk you through a little bit about what Kickstart is, and then uh, we'll uh, talk about a problem. So first of all, what is Kickstart? Uh, it's a CodeJam spin-off competition that's targeted mm -hmm. specifically at students. And uh, it used to be, so we only offered this in Asia at one point. It was called the APAC University Test for three years. But now we're excited to be expanding this to North America as well. And there are many online rounds. Uh, each one is kind of targeted at a certain geographic region, but anybody is welcome to participate in any of them. And uh, there are uh, various puzzles in each round designed by Google engineers like me and uh, other people. So I want to say a little bit about the difficulty of these problems. Uh, if you've looked at Code Jam, if you looked at like some of the world finals problems, for instance, from last year, you might be like, ah, like these are so hard. How in the world could I possibly solve these? So don't worry. The problems in these rounds are like, they range from maybe like a Code Jam qualification round problem to maybe like a hard Code Jam round one problem. Uh, we've targeted the difficulty appropriately for this audience. So even if you've never like done much coding, uh, like I, I, the first time I competed in Code Jam, I had barely coded, and I still had a great time because there's a range of difficulty levels. So please don't feel daunted about competing. So uh, as I said, there are some uh, rounds that are targeted toward North America in particular. So we have a practice round coming up this weekend, uh, Sunday, June 11th at noon, and that'll run for three hours. That contains only like problems from past Kickstart contests. So this is just for practice. Like the results of this don't matter. You can approach it as like a way to get familiar with the competition arena, but like you're not being judged or anything on this, just to try the problems and have fun. Then round C will be two weeks after that on June 25th. It'll also be at noon and it'll run for three hours. And then uh, a few months after that, September 24th, we're gonna have a, a kind of unusual 12 hour round. And in that round, you'll be able to start at any time, but if you want, to be con if you want your results to be considered by recruiters, for example, you'll need to uh, finish all the problems within three hours. Or sorry, not finish all the problems, but everything that you do submit needs to be within a certain three hour window. So there'll be more details on that as we get closer to that time. And so why do something like this? One reason is that some of the algorithms and techniques that you use in this kind of contest are similar to what you do day to day on the job at Google. Uh, and in particular, these prog uh, problems are very much like technical interview problems. So participating in these contests is excellent practice for that. Uh, it'll also show you what the Code Jam Arena is like. So if you do Kickstart this year and then you want to join the Code Jam Global Contest next year, you'll be all set to do that. Uh, depending on how you score in the rounds, and this, this threshold varies from round to round, uh, you may be contacted by a recruiter. Again, uh, don't worry about like what the exact cutoff is for each round. Like Just kind of solve as many problems as you can, and most importantly, have fun. So I personally think, and I hope you agree with me, this kind of problem is really fun to solve. Like If you have that insight, like, oh, I didn't get it. Oh, I see it. Oh, yeah. Like, you can get really, uh, like having that aha moment can be a real thrill. And you can come away with a problem learning a technique that you can apply on the job. I've actually done that. So lots of good reasons to uh, participate. And as for how to prepare for one of these, most of what you need you'll pretty much get in coursework. Uh, so fundamental algorithms, know how to sort, know data structures. Uh, it's really important to be comfortable with a, at least one programming language. Like there needs to be a language where you can quickly turn your thoughts into code without too many, uh, too many problems, too much debugging. You can use almost every any language you want. The terms list what's usable, but basically anything that's publicly available is okay. So just make sure there's one language where you're kind of ready to go and you don't waste too much time like looking up syntax and that sort of thing. And then also for CodeJam, it's really important to be able to test your code. So this is a good skill to have in general. Your coworkers will love you if you're good at testing your own code like down the line. But in the contest, if you get even one test case wrong, uh, uh, then it's you get zero points for the problem. Like that's kind of how it is in all these programming contests. So you need to think really hard, like what are the edge cases? What could make my code run too slowly or give an incorrect result? You wanna spend some time thinking about that before you uh, submit your code. And let's talk about what, what's actually involved in solving a problem. So when the contest opens, you'll see several problems. Uh, you can work on them in any order you want. They don't have separate timers or anything. Just pick one and start looking at it. Read the problem, think of an answer, write your solution. And then, oh, by the way, when you're writing your solution, you don't have to code beautifully. Like on the job, it's really good to write very clear code that's well commented. In a programming contest, we recognize that like, you know, everybody's kind of pressed for time. Uh, it's possible that like maybe recruiters will read the code or, and certainly like your colleagues doing the competition will be able to look at your code after the contest. 
But that said, everyone understands this is kind of a unique situation where speed is really helpful. So uh, anyway, when, you're, when you've written your code, you can push a button to download an input file. You'll run your code on that input file to generate output. And then you'll submit that output along with your source code. And if you get the small data set right, then yay, you can move on and do the same thing for the large data set. You might have to kind of rework your algorithm to make sure it's fast enough for the large. And if you're wrong, no worries on the small, you'll get a chance to resubmit and you just get a small penalty. You only get one chance at the large though. So again, like I said, make sure you test your code carefully, think about those test cases and be really happy with what you submit for the large. All right, so there's no better way to uh, learn than to walk through a, a, an exact actual kickstart problem. So I'm gonna pass it over here. Thank you, Ian. So this problem that we are gonna walk through is called evaluation. It's from, it's a third of the fourth problem from the round C of Kickstart 2016. So you can follow the short link that we have specified. So imagine that you are programming in a language like Python where everything is an, every variable is an object and uh, assume that there are functions which take multiple params. For example, function f takes two parameters. So what we have given you is a set of assignment operations. So for example, we say that A consumes the output of function f which takes para parameters b and c, where b and c are again some variables. So as you can see in the slide, there are three assignment operations. What you have to do is you have to decide for an ordering of these assignment operations such that they can be evaluated safely. So for example, uh, it's never guaranteed that any kind of ordering will work. So as you can see, uh, if the ordering of these assignments is kept as A, B, C, this will not work because A needs, uh, so to calculate e, A, we need the variables b and c to be available. However, b can be calculated without any dependencies. So uh, as a solution, you can see that the ordering b, c, a will work because b doesn't have any dependencies. Further, c can be calculated using the value of b and a finally can be calculated using the values of b and c. So, and further, it's never a guarantee, as I said. So imagine there's an assignment operation like a equal to f of a. Now this is a cyclic dependency. There's no guarantee that th this will work. So we have uh, these kind of complex interdependencies and th these could be really large in the size of the chain. So what, what uh, a very simple idea of approaching some problems is to think like how humans think, like really. So there are some operations that we are trying to do and what we can do is we can iterate through them, iterate through the whole list in order. And whenever we see a function we can evaluate with the info we have, we will evaluate it. And there's no reason we, we are not gonna do that because it can only help us later. So what happens if you reach the end of the list? There might still be some assignment operations left. So we, what we do is we start again. So in the given example, in the first iteration, we can calculate B and we can calculate C again because B has been calculated. In the next iteration, we can calculate A. So in two iterations, we can say that we can, uh, we, we have a valid ordering for these assignment operations. Now, what happens if you, uh, when do you stop? So the condition for stopping, you can say, is that if you make a full pass through the list once without evaluating anything, then it's impossible for all the op all the assignment operations to be done safely. Otherwise, uh, we will eventually evaluate everything and then we'll have a valid ordering, the order in which we evaluated the functions. Now, a very essential part of solving these programming puzzles is the efficiency of them. So c consider always consider the worst case of your algorithm. So imagine uh, you have a list of operations uh, li list of assignment operations and in one iteration you can only do one assignment. This will require you worst case order of n iterations and in that way your total algorithm would be order of n square which is a which is not that good for the large input large data set. It will work for the small but for the large we need to increase the efficiency of our algorithm. Now what you can do is so a, a very good approach to solving these kind of problems is to represent the input in an, another form. We can reframe the problem. We can um, reorganize the input that we have in a different kind of structure, which will help us visualize the input and come up with some efficient algorithms. So if you imagine 
these variables as nodes and the expressions as the directed edges, what we'll have is a directed graph. Now, what an edge from x to y means is that you must do x before y. So if a is dependent on b and c, we add, an ed we add two edges, one from b to a and one from c to a. Now, this might sound really similar to you. What we are looking at is a topological sort of a directed graph. What topological sort says that, given directed graph, you need to find a permutation of nodes such that for each edge from node i to node j, the node i should occur before node j in the permutation. So in the slide, as you can see, the permutation c, a, b is not a valid because there is an edge from b to c and b occurs after c in this permutation. However, all three edges satisfy the permutation b, c, a. Now, I'm going to walk through a really famous topological sorting algorithm. It's called Crane's algorithm. And so for, for you, what I have is a classical pancake recipe. Now, you have the ingredients, flour, eggs, milk, oil, and then you mix them. And finally, you cook them in a pan, which has some oil, heated oil. And then you finally serve. Of course, this is really stripped down. Uh, I mean, I would have loved if pancakes were th these easy to make. So now if you can do only one step at a time, what you're trying to do is to follow a topological sorting of these tasks. Of course, you can't serve before cooking and so on. So the idea is really similar to the greedy algorithm that we had formalized earlier. What we can do is we can do all the tasks which doesn't have any dependency. So you can follow any kind of ordering for these tasks. So for example, you can go to a shop where you get oil, or you can probably go to a supermarket where you get flour, eggs, milk, etc. When you do these tasks, some other tasks will be available for you to do. So what we can observe here is that doing some tasks opens up some new frontiers for us. So uh, as you can see, the next step would be to heat oil or sift and mix the ingredients we have. So the algorithm that we can formalize is at any step of the, uh, of the algorithm, what we are going to do is we are going to maintain a set of available tasks. And we are going to choose one of the tasks from this set to do. And doing this will uh, create some new tasks which don't have any more dependencies so that which uh, those tasks can be added to this set. So uh, the next step after formalizing an algorithm is to implement that in a language of your choice. And before implementing, you, you need to figure out some details like the kind of data structures you are going to use. So we need to represent the dependencies, that is the directed edges, and we need to represent the set of available tasks. Of course, the complexity of the algorithm is going to depend on the choice of these data structures. So if this set that we are going to maintain, if it is able uh, to handle insertion and removal in constant time, then that's the best we can do for such a set. So uh, I'll go into some detail here. And what we are going to do is for each node in the directed graph, we are going to maintain a list of vertices V such that there is an outgoing edge from U to V. Further, for all the nodes, we are also going to make, uh, maintain the number of dependencies that that certain node has, which will be equal to the number of in degrees it, is, it has. And further, uh, the invariant that we have is that the set S of nodes at all steps will have those vertices for which there are no dependencies. And further, we have this pseudo code, which simply says that if you have tasks to do, keep doing them and just choose one task out of this set S. Let's say it's you and just say that I'm going to do this task that is appended to the answer. Then for all the, uh, all the nodes V such that V were dependent on you, we are going to reduce the number of dependencies of V. And if doing so makes them available for doing, we add it to the set S. And finally, uh, we return our answer. Now, as you can observe, if set S is maintained like a queue or a hash map even, uh, the complexity will be order of number of node, number of nodes and plus number of edges as we are traversing through both only once. So, So that was an example of one kickstart problem that happened to have a kind of well-known algorithm lurking underneath the surface. But it's important to remember, not every problem is going to be like that. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to have kind of a creative insight of your own. 
And there are a lot of ways to arrive there. I mean, one way to do it is to like work through a few small cases by hand. Like, let's say you see a problem and you don't really know where to begin. So work on some small cases, and you might see a pattern that you can then apply to the um, the whole like the small data set or even the large data set. So doing some thinking before writing any code could be really helpful. But everybody's style is a little bit different, right? Like some people may like be able to think while they code, and kind of and that that synergy might work well for them. So. Just be prepared for not only standard algorithms, but uh, original insights as well. And I think with that, we'll uh, open it up to questions. So uh, we'll take some questions about Kickstart, about this problem, anything you're interested in. All right, so we have a first question. Uh, are we at a disadvantage for not having done rounds A and B? So I want to emphasize that the Kickstart rounds are all independent. Uh, competing in one doesn't influence, like, how you'll be evaluated on any future rounds. There's no advancement structure like in regular code jam where you have to get to round one and then get to round two and so on. So you're not at a disadvantage. And in fact, like if you're worried, oh, I haven't done the same problems, so I haven't had enough practice, you can go to the past problems page and uh, see the round A and B problems and uh, work through them and think through them. OK, and we have another. Uh, are there limitations to the number of times or attempts you can try out problems? Do you want to fill that one? So uh, as as Ian had said earlier, for the small data set, you can submit any, uh, you can try any number of times. You will be shown the uh, result of the attempt immediately. However, for the large data set, you can only attempt once, and the result for that will be shown to you at the end of the round. Yeah, that builds up a little bit of drama. You won't know r right away whether your large was correct. So even if it looks like somebody else has solved all the problems, uh, they may not have all the answers right. All right, so we have another question. Uh, how related is actual software engineering at Google to this kind of contest? So it's a fair point that programming contest problems are not necessarily exactly like what you do at work. Like I don't spend my day at work arranging pieces on a chessboard in a certain arcane way or finding like the nth prime number or whatever. Actually, I do do some of that because my job is to help write code jam. But in general, most software engineers don't do that. However, uh, getting a good algorithm is, is really important on the job in addition to these contest problems. I've seen a real world situation at work where somebody coded something thinking, oh, you know, like this is O of n squared, but the list is never going to be that big, right? And at the time, like that was true, the list would never get that big. But then things changed down the line and a list with tons of elements made it in. And this was this actually like crashed an entire pipeline because it took so long to evaluate that uh, that list sort of squared with itself. Uh, do you want to add um, anything about that? Yeah. So I think uh, these kind of programming can contests, they help you think about the complexities and they, they test rigorously uh, the, what kind of corner cases you are covering, how much uh, you are thinking about the problem actually. So just uh, just an analogy that I like to make is that imagine this uh, programming contest as walking out in the gym and the actual software engineering job as working for Marines in the US Army. So I think uh, for, for a person uh, who is looking to get in, into the Marines, Doing this uh, uh, workout is a good option. Yeah, there's there's not much better practice than actually solving these contest problems. I would say that's probably the best way to prepare for the contest. Sorry, one second. Uh, we have another question. How much coding or programming experience do I need to participate? So when I started Code Jam, I had barely done any coding. And I was able to kind of, I mean, I didn't do amazing, but I was able to kind of pull my way along. And I learned a little more and got better and better in future rounds. I would say that, so that problem that we showed you had topological sort in it. So if you hadn't been exposed to that idea before, it might have been a little bit hard to come up with naturally. But you still could have gotten the small data set of that problem just by coming up with the greedy algorithm and running through that. Um, so we try to set it so that anybody can come in and have insights and make a lot of progress. But to get every single problem right, again, which is not necessarily needed for recruiters to take an interest in the performance, uh, you might have to have seen a lot of um, algorithms and, and coursework and so on. So uh, at the end of the day, you're dealing with logic abstractions. And programming is just a tool to convert uh, these abstractions into, uh, into code. So uh, I have seen people with a mathematical background performing really well in these kind of programming contests once they get hold of the basic data structures and the programming language. So uh, apart from the basics of a programming language, uh, I, I won't say that you need a lot of experience. All right, so we have, uh, when a problem is given, how do you approach it and what should be the thought process? So I 
other people's mileage may vary here, but I find that it's very rare that I just look at a problem and instantly know what to do. It often helps me to kind of think through some individual cases and try to spot a pattern. But then everyone has a different strategy. So, uh, Lali, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, the, the kind of thing we did in this topological sort problem, what we did was uh, we tried to represent the input in a different way. We, we represented the dependencies as a graph. So the first thing is to strip down uh, from the problem the nitty gritties and try to make a make it a general form of it. So for example, you can uh, you can summarize the problem in one sentence. You can say that given a directed acyclic graph, find the longest path through it. So once you get down to the bare bones of the problem, then you can probably go ahead with your uh, standard techniques that you know of, basically some uh, dynamic programming, greedy algorithms. And once you explore uh, a certain paths of exploring, uh, of solving the problem, you, you need to uh, prove some things on the way, such that uh, you are not going entirely into, into the wrong directions. And um, usually what I do is I, I don't code before uh, once I have finalized and proved my algorithm. And I think that that's a good strategy. The uh, famous computer scientist uh, Dijkstra uh, uh, said once, like, people should write out their whole code on paper before like typing anything. And this was in the era when computing resources were more expensive and you really didn't want to waste time like writing a program the wrong way. I'm not going to advocate that everybody write everything out on paper, like Dijkstra said, but I think his point is worth thinking about. It can save you a lot of time to have the idea correct before you start writing any code sometimes. Okay, so we have uh, what level of student is this competition for? So uh, that's something I meant to mention earlier. Uh, by student, like I include um, undergraduate, so the secondary ed education, undergraduate, but all the way up through PhD. So anybody in that range is welcome. But again, even if you're not a student, you're welcome to still participate in Kickstart. It's just kind of targeted specifically towards students. And we have, how are top participants determined after each round? So mm -hmm. the rank, the score, or do you want to talk about the scoring system? Uh, so like, for each problem, there, there is certain points attached to it. So, for example, for the small input, there might be five points, and for the large data set, it might be 10 points. So, at the end of the contest, your score is summed, and then there are penalties for uh, wrong attempts on the small data set, and that will cost you 20 minutes penalty. Uh, four, four minutes. Four minutes, sorry. Yeah, four minutes penalty. And then for the number of people, uh, for, for people with the same score, uh, we take this time penalty in consideration, and otherwise the total score is taken into consideration. So you have to sometimes make a strategic decision about whether to go for the small data set for a problem or to like maybe like think a little bit harder and eventually get the large. And we give the problems point values to help you make this decision. At the end of the day, it's your total number of points that matters first, and then uh, time penalty will be the tiebreaker. So if you have maybe five minutes left in the contest and you know how to do one of the smalls, it might be better to just like bang out the code for that small and get those eight points or whatever. But if you have an hour left and you're debating whether to do the small or the large, you have to think like, well, you know, how many other people are going to solve the small? If I get one of the larges, is that going to be a big advantage? Uh, you just have to kind of like pick and choose based on your confidence level that you can solve individual data sets. Oh, uh, here's a great question. Are our programs also judged on space complexity? So CodeJam is a little bit unique right now in that you're running the code on your own machine. Uh, in a lot of other contests, like you'll be given a specific memory limit, and if you go over that memory limit, then your solution will be marked wrong. But since you're running on your own computer, it's kind of up to you to pick whatever space complexity doesn't like give you a heap overflow or like otherwise crash your machine. But you're going to be evaluated pretty much on whether you're able to create the right set of answers for your uh, input data set. And you'll never like lose points after the fact because someone looks at your code and says, oh, well, the space complexity of this is not great. So I would encourage you to code in a way that doesn't make your machine hang in the middle of a contest by trying to create a list with like 80 billion elements or something like that. But space complexity is not as important in this contest as time complexity, I would say. Yeah. Uh, we have, how do you develop the skills for finding corner test cases? So I'm not sure if this is asking how we actually write the corner test cases or how the competitors, uh, or how competitors should uh, develop them. It's pretty similar though. So do you want to field this one? Uh, so like most of it is intuition, but there's there's a trick that I usually employ. I mean, I had to employ in context. So for example, you're solving a problem and you're getting a wrong answer repeatedly. What you can do is uh, look at the constraints and 
write a brute force solution that you know is perfectly working because uh, you're applying brute force and if your implementation skills are not that bad you're not going to make a mistake in the brute force solution for the you write a generator which generates all the possible inputs so uh, of course that will cover the sample inputs for you and um, then you can match the output of your brute force solution with the solution that you have written so th this technique has been really useful to me sometimes and but there's no guarantee that this will work so uh, so i remember uh, so f for a few of the contestants uh, uh, it, it didn't work out really well because it's not always possible that you generate every possible case so you might have to think like a problem designer like we do so we in general i want to uh, that's great advice that i think you should follow i do that all, all the time when competing uh, when we're designing the small data set we try to cover every corner case we can think of we never want to sort of like trick you by having the small data set be really easy and then you're like oh well my same code will work for the large and then you miss some like corner case. It's possible that because of the way the small and large limits are set, there might be phenomena that only emerge in the large data set that you won't find in the small. The most obvious of these, like which is all true almost every time, is that the large data set has like larger numbers or more data or something. So your code has to be efficient to run it. But what we try to do is we we won't have like a liter so if there's some problem involving like points on a cube or something, like we won't like only put corners like in the large data set and not in the small data set, because that would be mean. And it wouldn't like meet our goals of you know fairly evaluating estimates. So yeah, uh, just just to add one thing, like uh, if if your code is efficient enough and it's working on the small data set, mostly uh, you are missing out on uh, some uh, issues that occur due to large values, which is like uh, integer overflow uh, could be possibly one of the cases. Yeah. All right. So we have uh, what graph algorithm should I know that would help me during the contest? Um, so in these cutting contests, Dijkstra's algorithm comes up a fair bit. Uh, definitely worth knowing. I mean, that's a nice, classic, beautiful algorithm anyway. So if it's not in your toolbox, uh, that one probably should be. And topological sort is arguably, I mean, uh, as uh, Lalit showed, is arguably a graph algorithm. A lot of other graph problems, and these might not come up necessarily as much in Kickstart, but like it's common to have to do dynamic programming on a graph. So knowing how dynamic programming works is really helpful in con a programming contest. Probably more so than like on the job, but that's a skill that's worth developing uh, for not only this but technical interviews. Any other sort of graph algorithms? Uh, like basic algorithms, like depth first search, breadth first search, should suffice for Kickstart. Yeah, I agree. All right, how does the difficulty compare to the global code jam competition? So yeah, it's going to be mostly like qualification round and round one type problems, uh, not getting into like round two and I mean in code jam it's not like all the round one problems are the same difficulty, but the hardest kickstart problem is generally going to be like the hardest round one problem. And sometimes those, those can be pretty hard. I mean, we've seen quite a range in kickstart. Like sometimes the very hardest problem only gets a handful of solutions, but at other times it'll get hundreds or even more. So we try to provide a range so that there's like at least one problem where everyone can kind of like get started and warmed up and then the difficulty ramps up enough and just kind of keep going up that hill uh, until time runs out. And we have, how long do, do rounds usually last? So they're always three hours, except for that 12 hour round, which is kind of a new experimental thing for Kickstart. And again, we'll make sure we post more details on that as we get closer to that. Uh, is there a way to know who is in the lead similar to other coding competitions? Uh, like, uh, I mean. Like the, the scoreboard, for instance. Okay, uh, yeah, you can have a look at the scoreboard, but there's no guarantee that someone who has submitted all the solutions is going to uh, finally uh, get get those correct so but as, as a general rule uh, if someone's getting his small correct and is trying to attempt the large uh, there's a fair chance they'll make it so but in kickstart i'd kind of encourage you not to worry about who's in the lead because it's not like in code jam where like exactly 25 people are going to be flown to dublin to compete in the finals uh, if everybody achieves a certain score that's sort of above or at the cutoff or above it all of those people in theory could be eligible for contact by the recruiter. So it might be useful. So there's one exception, which is looking at how many people have solved each problem can kind of tell you which problems are more tractable and which ones might be easiest to work on first. Usually this is in the order that we present them. Sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't end up that way. So that can help you pick and choose what to work on. But again, don't time spent looking at the scoreboard and looking at other people's scores is time you could be coding up answers to the problems is how I like to think of it. All right, so uh, 
Okay, and one last question. Uh, how do you decide which algorithm is best to uh, implement to solve a problem? Uh, the one which gets you the accepted <laughs> yeah. uh, For the uh, What you can take a factor is the complexity of implementation. I mean, I'm not talking about the time complexity, but uh, the complexity of implementation on your part. So, for example, you're trying to solve a geometry problem, and sometimes you might want to go uh, just deal with all the variables and doubles, uh, floating point integers, but how if you're implementing it through uh, maintaining all the uh, in geometric coordinates as uh, integers that that might help with the complexity of implementation sometimes. And I will say, like it's okay to come in with algorithms that you've pre-written yourself. Like you might have like a Dijkstra's like function written up before the contest. You shouldn't feel any undue pressure to come in with a giant library of uh, pre-coded stuff because, as I said, there's a lot of a lot of problems where you have to have an original insight and you're writing original code. But you're welcome to do that uh, uh, if you if it helps you prepare better. So I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, don't forget to register at uh, g.co slash uh, codejam kickstart, all one word. And you can look at our FAQs or our terms and conditions, or you can reach out to uh, codejamkickstart at google.com if you have any questions. So thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks.